Hello and welcome to this week's edition of The Road to Indy, presented by Southern Seminary and Boyce College. Got a great episode for you today talking about resource, and specifically one resource, that is coming from the Abuse Reform Implementation Task Force later this year as we get closer to the annual meeting. So joining me today is Chris Buckman from Maryland, Delaware. Uh, she's uh, there in the uh, the Delmarva area of the country. And then also Brad Eubank from Mississippi. He's in Petal, Mississippi at, uh, at Petal at First. And uh, Brad, you know, we've talked about this. You got some members and deacons, I think, actually in your church that went to college with me. So it's always good to to, to hang out with you. Man, that's awesome. I, I didn't realize that. We'll have to talk yeah. about that later. That's fantastic. Yeah. So right, right the across the room. right across the way there from Hattiesburg, uh, Pedal is, and uh, yeah. I, I've been to I've been to your church. It's been twenty years, but and you weren't there, but but uh, I was there back in the day. So. Uh, it's good to have you on the show, and and you know, thank you. I, first, I just want to say thank you both uh, for your service to Southern Baptist on the ARITF this past year. Uh, you, you've and actually, Brad, I think you've been around for a couple of years now on it, and uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job, and we really appreciate everything that you've done uh, for Southern Baptists. And wanted to to have you on today to talk about the new resource, what it is, what it isn't, and you know how it's going to help churches, and what you know how churches can use it. Uh, within their church as as they're looking to care well. And I use that word kind of as a segue into what this resource is not. It's, you know, we we had something come out a few years ago in 2019, Caring Well. This is not a replacement for Caring Well. Y'all, y'all were quick to tell me that uh, prior to the show today. So Brad, talk to us about that and what how this goes kind of like alongside of it and even supplements uh, what churches have been doing for the last few years. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. And uh, we honored and humble we get to serve with the RITF. It's been a, it's been a joy and an honor uh, to serve that way. One of the things we, we learned early on was to learn to listen. Sometimes we think we have great ideas, but sometimes we learn to listen. And as we listened um, to AMS leaders, to state executives, to uh, different folks on the ground, pastors, we started hearing a little bit that um, there were some challenges that were perceived from Caring Well. It's an excellent resource. It's so well done. It includes experts uh, across the country uh, that kind of morphed into the church cares piece, uh, the book and the videos that go along with Caring Well. And one of the things we discovered is sometimes people weren't finishing and it all happened right before COVID. And so it just kind of yeah. felt like it lost some momentum. But really what this new curriculum is called Essentials is it's kind of a 1.0, if you will. Um, and it's really targeted at our normative sized churches. Um, any church could, of course, use this by all means. Uh, and we have churches here in Mississippi uh, that we're working with that are smaller churches running 50. And I spoke to a church a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they've got 50 staff members on their church. And so it can it can run the gamut of how it can help them. But it's kind of a, a starting point. How do you start? You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. How do I get started? We want to kind of walk them through that process. And so it just kind of starts. You can jump then to Caring Well and do Church Cares. It's a part of Caring Well. In fact, we refer to uh, the Church Cares resource in our curriculum itself to go deeper on some of the topics. And so it's just designed to be more maybe of an entry level, if you will, uh, resource that we really believe is going to be really helpful for churches. Now, if you're going to the SBC annual meeting, you'll be able to pick up a physical copy. You'll also be able to get a digital copy online. You can visit the sbcabuseprevention.com website uh, to find that and find more information about that. But you you mentioned this is the essentials. And it's basically five steps, five things that you really need to know and really need to do in your church. Chris, uh, that that first essential is to train well in your church. you got to train your volunteers and, and your staff, actually. Yeah, and actually, this is kind of the piece that we find a lot of churches um, overlook or skip, and they jump right to screening. Yeah, jump right to screening. Yep. Yeah, and then they'll show them their big policies and procedures document, which people will skim through and say, yeah, yeah, I agree. But really, we've discovered that if they're trained in sexual abuse awareness, um, they have a firm understanding of what the real risks are and what to look out for. Then they better understand why they're being put through the screening process, and they understand your policies and procedures document. And so last year um, in New Orleans, we sent out, gave out a rack card that had five things on it. And then on the other side, it had a list of five questions, kind of a very short um, assessment of your church. And so this curriculum is a follow-up to that. And so the idea is that once you go through this curriculum, you'll be able to answer yes to all of the questions on the back of that rack card. And so we kind of really just took each piece one at a time. Um, And it's not 
It's not going to happen quickly. It will take churches several weeks to implement each step. But the idea is to go through it um, in the order we have set up, and then it gives them next yeah. steps for exactly what to do next. Yeah, and, and the training piece is so important because that really sets the foundational why for the rest of the uh, the stuff there. And, and you know, you mentioned screening, Chris. It, that is the piece I think that churches have started doing well that we've seen. Like, uh, even before the Caring Well curriculum and, you know, the, the that came out, we were seeing churches start to move down the road for screening. That that was a known thing to do, it seems. Now, not every, every church does that, but we're getting closer than we have been. But the training piece, I think you're right. They they did kind of skip over that. But when we get to the screening, Chris, like what, what does that look like in a church for those that may think that they're doing screening well, and then also maybe the ones that haven't done it before? Sure. So in the curriculum, we recommend a five-step screening process, all under the umbrella of first having someone there for at least six months, whether it's a member or an attender. Um, but we found that churches were doing parts of the screening process, like maybe just the background check um, or just an application and a background check. But really, when you take all five elements, an application, a background check, references, an internet and social media review, and an interview together, you really get that 360-degree, well-rounded look at somebody. And so I kind of reference it like when you go through the airport and you stand in that thing and it scans all the way around you. A lot of times churches are only getting half of the picture of somebody. And so one of the areas of screening could not give them good enough information so they can follow up with all the other areas and have a complete picture of someone. Yeah, and, and that leads us to the third aspect and, and one of the most important things. It's great to, to train people and to screen people, if, but if you don't protect, then you, you've, you've really dropped the ball. Brad, I mean, you talk about the importance of, of that piece of the, the curriculum and as well as the, just the, the whole view of protecting when it comes to sex abuse. Right. And that is, you know, we give uh, ideas and suggestions on what policies and procedures that you need to have in place. Um, and a lot of them are not rocket science, but sometimes they can be, especially when the settings where we're struggling to find volunteers. Yeah. Uh, and so it just helps you outline, here's some things you need to consider when you're putting together policies and procedures. And not only do you have to have them, you actually have to enforce them, which sometimes can be a challenge. I mean, I, at our church last night, we had somebody not show up. And so we had one classroom with one, one teacher in it. And so we had to make some adjustments because that violates our policies. And so uh, having them is important, but also enforcing them across mm -hmm. the board, whether it's somebody that's your best friend or somebody that you don't know, that you you absolutely have to have those policies and procedures that provide guidelines and help you know if somebody steps across that line, then you know what are the consequences if they stepped across that line. And so it makes it much clearer, much easier. Your whole church knows where you stand on those issues. And those that are coming in from the outside know where you stand and what those policies are. Yeah. And, and when those lines do get crossed, that leads to the next aspect. And Chris, you know, we were talking before we, we started today. This is maybe the area that I think churches mean well, but execute poorly. And it's reporting. Uh, we, we see it time and time again, unfortunately, a lot of times where churches, something happens in the church and the reporting doesn't quite match what it should be a lot of times. Yeah, a lot of times I'll look at a church's policy and when you get to the reporting section, it just says, we report everything and here's the phone number. But reporting really involves so much more reporting externally and how to do that and when to do that and what information you need to give, what information you need to get but also reporting internally through the church and having a clear plan set up for communication as far as confidentiality, who needs to know what, at what point do we contact our insurance company, at what point do we speak with the victim and the perpetrator, and what do we do with that? And so the reporting section of this piece, it is the longest training video for that reason, because mm -hmm. um, we do find that churches lack a plan, almost like a fire escape plan, um, it lacks a complete response plan. And so we give an actual sample response plan step by step. There's a great training video that's in there, next steps, lots of helpful information from a lawyer. And so um, I feel it'll really take churches to the next level and that will help eliminate. Um, sometimes I think churches feel like they're doing the right thing or they're not really sure what to do. And that's where we kind of mess up and make mistakes that hurt victims. Um, and kind of muddle the whole process. Yeah, it, it, this is one of those plans that needs to be as robust as possible and used as least as possible. I mean, like you don't want to use these plans. I mean, that means you know, you've had an issue. Not saying don't use it, but it's, it's something that you want to have 
and never need because if you need it if you need it and don't have it you're in a, a lot of you're in a bad spot really as a church um, and we've seen churches over the last few years you know in the news about this because of, not because of something happening but because of the failure to report and reporting poorly um, mm-hmm. you know those those headlines you know we've seen them recently in fact and the good thing I think about this curriculum the, you give flow charts you give the process. It's not like you're having to come up with it from scratch at your church. You guys provide that within the curriculum. Yeah, and it's really helpful. You know, I've had this conversation with several pastors over the last year, and they'll call and say, you know, nothing trained me for this. I I went to seminary 30 years ago, and this is probably the worst day of my life. And to be able to tell them, hey, look, there is a process in which you can walk through. You don't have to just try to figure this out on the fly. And that's, again, where people get in trouble. You figure it out under a crisis. And so you react instead of being proactive. And so we, I yeah. think it really will help churches be proactive and feel much more at ease. They can handle this in the right way under, which is very difficult. They're very difficult circumstances yeah. when you end up at this kind of spot. Yeah. And Chris mentioned something a minute ago, Brad, that, you know, talking to the victim, caring for the victim, that is the final point. And probably one of the points that we think we do well sometimes, but often maybe muddy the waters a lot of times. So why, why is, why is care so, so important? Well, and it's unintentional. Uh, yeah. And I'm a survivor myself. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've learned a lot about caring for survivors and victims myself of understanding um, what needs to be done and some of the things that don't need to be done. How do you not re-victimize somebody? How do you do those things? And so I love I love this section of the resource. Uh, we brought um, somebody in, a counselor, to help us think through this. And really, we facilitate how do you talk to your church? How do you talk to a survivor? And how do you talk to a perpetrator How do you care for all three of those? And that's really a unique thing. And it really kind of literally is a, they give you formats and letters of how do you share the information. It's really, really helpful. The other thing is that I've learned in our own churches, we've not cared well for those in our churches who may not have been abused inside of a church, or they could have been, but we have statistics tell us that 20, 25% of churches or 20 to 25% of people sitting in your church each Sunday have experienced abuse. How do we help them? How do we yeah. minister to them? One of the things we don't we talked about 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't talk about abortion in church. Now it's talked about in abortion recovery and, and all those kind of things, but we've not talked about abuse. It's become still a taboo subject, but I, we have great hopes that in the caring piece, there's a great series by a guy named Dr. James Reeves out of Fort Worth, Texas. There's a series called Spearless. It's the only thing I've seen that really helps churches. Yeah. How do you help churches minister to victims? Uh, and to survivors and their families. And it's it has been it's been game changer for our church, for some ladies in our church who had experienced abuse, didn't even realize they experienced abuse. And now as we've cared well for them, they're now at a much healthier place. Their marriage is in a better place. Their parenting is in a better place. Um, and, and their lives have really been transformed because of it. So it'll give them step by step. How do you care well in having conversations kind of tied to the reporting piece, but also what are some things we need to do to care along the way in the process? Yeah. Now, Chris, if somebody comes to Indianapolis, they get a copy of the book or they go to the website and they download it there. What, what's the steps to implement? Like walk me through, I get back home from Indy. I've got this resource now. Go. Sure. So when they, we will have a booth at the, uh, in the resource um, hall in Indianapolis, they'll get a hard copy of the book and attached to that will be a thumb drive that also has all the videos on it for churches that may not have access to the cool. internet. So it'll be on a thumb drive, hard drive, or hard copy, or they can go to the website. So once they come home with that resource in hand, we really recommend taking um, five leaders of their church leadership, whether it's the pastor, a deacon, a kidman leader, a youth leader, five people to sit down and spend some time and watch the videos. And then as the videos are done, read the section of the book. And then we list actual three or four next steps for everyone, like literally the next step for train is find a training provider online, pick one. Yeah. And Here you list those good... in the in the book. I mean, they're in yes. the, the, the supplement in the back. Yeah. And we give you like how to be a good consumer of purchasing a training curriculum or abuse training. And so they go through those steps. And then once those are completed, they move on to screen and they gather again and view the next video and then read the next steps for that and go through that process. So it can really be done with just church leadership is really who this curriculum is meant for, the ones that make decisions and set policies. And so they will go through that. And we we caution churches, you know, it's not a six-week curriculum. It's not a six-month curriculum. It's not a 12 month, it's however long it takes your church to get things done in the process. And so as long as you're moving through that process, 
Um, that's really something we urge churches. Don't, don't put a time limit. Don't rush through it. Make sure you get everything done before you move on to the next piece. All right. And you, you mentioned, you know, gathering the leadership, the pastor's leadership here is important. Uh, Brad, as a pastor, what would your encouragement be to fellow pastors regarding this and regarding, you know, doing well when it comes to, to caring, to reporting, to, uh, you know, training, everything that we've talked about today? What, what would be your encouragement to pastors maybe watching at home today? Well, my encouragement is, and it takes us back to the first piece of train, is helping pastors understand this is a gospel issue. Um, sometimes it's been framed as a cultural issue, as a woke issue, as a liberal issue. And the reality is this is a gospel issue. Jesus spoke about the fact that we need to take care of those uh, who God has entrusted to us. And if we don't, uh, better for a millstone to be hung around our neck and thrown in the depth of the sea. And so um, we're called to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And so I think the opportunity that lies before us for churches to take giant leaps in our Southern Baptist Convention, uh, if they will take and implement these five steps, we call it the 555 plan, five leaders over five months to walk through the five steps. It's kind of the thought process. And um, if churches will take the time to do this, we think that it's doable, it's it's transferable, it's there's supplements in there, there's frequently asked questions in there. Um, it's not that long. It's um, it's 15 to 20 minutes per video, except for the report section video. And so we think it's completely attainable. And we are praying that we'd see literally 10 to 15,000 churches uh, implement this over the next two to three years. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And, and finally, Chris, uh, you, you've been instrumental in what's going on in Maryland, Delaware, as far as how the state convention is helping resource churches and coming alongside them. I know, Brad, you've been involved in Mississippi as well. But, but Chris, talk to us about like what you've seen over the last couple of years as you've been involved in this on the state level and, and how you've seen state conventions come along and, and just the benefits that you've seen in the churches because of that. Sure. And I really think, as Brad mentioned in the church, this comes from the top down. Yeah. So it's so important from the pastor to be on board and then for that to come down. And likewise, in the convention, um, if the convention, it comes from the top down, if the convention's voice is loud and clear on these are the things you need to do, we can resource you, we can help you, then we see it trickle down into our churches. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen in Maryland and Delaware, um, our churches just really embrace this. And just from the phone calls that I get, I'm getting more phone calls, but they're not more incidences. They're more phone calls like, hey, we're going to start a youth mentoring program. What are the policies we should yeah. have for that? So churches are starting to think about this first before they jump into new ministries. And that's really where we want to see churches going. Let's put this on the forefront of everything that we do. And so we're starting to just see a culture change and churches just um, embrace this, these five things and it's doable. And um, we're just starting to see a lot of churches have a clear mindset change towards safety in this area. Yeah. So like you said, the Abuse Reform Implementation Task Force will have a booth in the exhibit hall at the annual meeting, and you can visit that. Um, there, it's booth 1021. I was looking it up real quick. 1021 is the booth. It'll be kind of right there in the front of the hall if you're coming in that Hall D entrance. But uh, visit booth 1021. Pick up your copy of Essentials from the ARITF. Chris and Brad, thank you all so much for being a part of this today. We really appreciate having you on. Thank, thank you. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate you, Jonathan. Thank you. All right. And thank you for watching at home. And we want to remind you that your road to Indy and your road back home should include a quick side trip to Southern Seminary and Boyce College. You can go to sbts.edu slash road trip to see what Southern has planned for SBC 24 road trippers just like you. Again, we hope to see you in Indianapolis in June. Join us again next week right here on the Road to Indy presented by Southern Seminary and Boyce College.